Well, a warm welcome to this talk. Now, researchers at Yale University in the States seem to be recognising something called post-vaccine syndrome. Now, this is probably better late than never. We've been talking about it on this channel for years now. It's still not officially recognised by the medical authorities as a diagnosis. Anyway, let's see what the researchers at Yale have said. Now, I'm going to show you this. This is from a combination of this report here. Yale researchers recognise post-vaccination syndrome. Uh, that's not quite the title of the report, but that, you can read it for yourself there. And this is the paper that it's based on, immunological and antigenic signatures associated with chronic illness after COVID-19 vaccination. And of course, as always, the links are, are there for your perusal. Check it out. Quite a complicated paper, actually, I must say. It took me quite a while to, to wade through it. Um, and I've simplified it, hopefully without being simplistic. So let's dive straight into what it says, because there is quite a bit of new stuff here that we do need to know about and that people need to know about and that medical establishments need to know about, that doctors need to know about so they can write it as a diagnosis so these patients could be properly recognised and properly treated. And I am expecting much more on this from the data that's going to be released by the new administration in the States as well. But let's, let's look at what we know for now. Now, here we have here uh, chronic symptoms that develop a day or two uh, after receiving COVID-19 vaccination. Now, we have talked to people on this channel who developed symptom, symptoms minutes, seconds after COVID-19 vaccination. But typically with one to two days is what they're saying, but then it can go on. Well, it's still going on now. So we, we don't know. This is, a, this is like a, an indeterminate uh, sentence for many of these people. So very rapid onset of a chronic ongoing Syndrome is what we are finding, consistent with what the Yale researchers are saying here. Um, can become more severe in the days that follow, so it can get worse. They can notice after a day or two, then it can become progressively worse over a few days. And they say post-vaccine syndrome, little understood, persist persistent conditions, remains unrecognised by the medical authorities which of course is inexcusable, especially now as the Yale researchers give some clinical features. So um, if these are recognised by doctors and nurses, they should think of post-vaccination syndrome, post-COVID vaccination syndrome. 85% experienced excessive fatigue. Uh, tingling and numbness, 80%. Exercise intolerance, 80%. Brain fog, 77.5%. Difficulty concentrating and focusing. Trouble falling or staying asleep. Neuropathy. And we can see here that these are all quite concerning because these are largely nervous system related symptoms, whether it's the brain or the peripheral nervous system. And later, the researchers do say they identify that the lipid nanoparticles from the vaccine can go through the blood-brain barrier. Now, normally, if you've got an infection, it doesn't affect your brain directly. And most, things, most toxins don't get into the brain. Alcohol and cannabis are obvious exceptions because of their solubility profiles. But most things don't get into the brain. But these lipid nanoparticles do. They get into the brain, they get into the central nervous system, they get through the blood-brain barrier. That means they go into cells in the central nervous system. They'll hijack these cells in the central nervous system. They'll force them to make these spike proteins and you'll get spike protein being presented on cells in the central nervous system that will then be, then be recognised by the immune system. It's obvious and it's not surprising that people get these uh, symptoms, these neurological symptoms. Muscle aches as well, anxiety. Not surprising, but the anxiety can be pretty bad or appalling in some people. Tinnitus ringing in the ears, burning sensations. Again, these are associated very often with peripheral neuropathy. But they also report getting out of breath, palpitations, headache, dizziness and low quality of life scores. So we see a lot of neurological features there, but we've got a lot of features that are non-neurological as well. But very concerning that this is affecting the central nervous system and the peripheral nerves. Why is this so concerning? Because we know that the central nervous system and, and even the peripheral nervous system have very limited powers of regeneration. Um, I'm afraid this, to, to my superficial understanding at the moment, doesn't look like a good prognostic factor. People with spinal injuries, of course, can have it indefinitely. Having said that, there's a lot we don't know. We are at an early stage because the research has not been done because the condition has been officially denied. So how can the research be getting done? It's not. Once more research is done, 
then there is much more hope for these people. And we've already talked to people and doctors around the world who have great success treating uh, these patients with uh, sometimes um, means that we might not be able to immediately mention on this video. But if you watch previous videos, you'll know what I'm talking about. So pretty horrible symptoms. Now, plausible mechanisms of action are always important, of course. Vaccine induced immune responses may be triggering the stimulation of autoreactive lymphocytes, these white blood cells. We're dealing with stimulation of the immune system resulting in autoimmunity, abnormal stimulation of the immune system resulting in autoimmunity is what we are probably dealing with here. Um, unregulated stimulation of innate immunity could lead to chronic inflammation, obviously. Participants with post-vaccine syndrome had a distinct set of antibodies, so again, an immunological thing. And a subset of non-classical monocytes has been shown to harbour S-protein in patients with post-vaccine syndrome. Now, they don't go into the details about these monocytes. Monocytes are the big white blood, big, very big white blood cells. Uh, they become very um, more predominant in chronic infections, such as tuberculosis, for example. You can also find them in some... Um, or the, the, the macrophages that the monocytes transform into, you can find in, in, in wounds. But the fact is that the spike protein is persisting, or the production of the spike protein seems to be persisting, and these monocytes are one possible area of that, although I suspect that there's other nervous system cells are still producing spike protein, not that we know that definitively from this paper. Um, so uh, biodistribution studies on the mRNA lipid nanoparticle platforms indicate the ability to cross the blood-brain barrier, as we've said, and the local spike protein expression could result in neurocognitive symptoms. Neuro, brain, cognitive, mind, basically. Triggering things like the brain fog and the anxiety, uh, p potentially, from that. So... Uh, Plausible mechanisms of action. So we've got correlations, we've got the history, we've got the fact that this, these syndromes start within minutes or seconds, or certainly within a day or two after the vaccination, that it can get worse for a while. And all these plausible mechanisms of action. The mainstream medical establishment can't keep ignoring this for much longer. Or can they? Um, scientifically, I would say they can't because the evidence is here. Bradford Hill will be well and truly satisfied. Compared to controls, post-vaccine syndrome had reduced circulating memory and effector CD4 T cells and an increase in TNF alpha and CD8 T cells. Let me just explain <laughs> what my understanding of these is. So the CD4 cells, you've probably heard of those because these are the, the, these are the helper cells. These help the body natural immune uh, mechanisms when you have an infection because CD4 cells are affected in, in HIV, human immunodeficiency virus resulting in, in acquired immune deficiency syndrome. So they're down. The TNF alpha, that's the, the tissue necrosing factor alpha cytokine is pro-inflammatory. It stimulates inflammation and it's associated with chronic inflammation and it's associated with ongoing autoimmune disease. And the CD8 lymphocytes, they are the cytotoxic cells that can actually kill uh, virally infected cells. So they're high, indicating perhaps ongoing activity, damaging potentially cells in the body that are still expressing this spike protein. It does make sense. So more inflammatory markers, less helper T cells, more cytotoxic cells, not a good combination for chronic inflammation and this condition going on sadly for uh, some years now already. Now, serological evidence further uh, supports Epstein-Barr virus reactivation. So people with post-vaccine syndrome seem to have more reactivation of Epstein-Barr virus. Now, it's a nasty virus. It can cause something called infective mononucleosis. We've probably all been exposed to it, and it's probably dormant in, in who, who knows, the majority of the population. But if the immune system is suppressed, for example, by a lack of CD4 helper lymphocytes, then the Epstein-Barr virus thinks, goody, goody, gumdrops, I can proliferate again and can cause reactivation of Epstein-Barr virus, which is not at all a good one to have. People with that can be very ill indeed. Um, 
Measured levels of SARS coronavirus 2 spike protein participants with post vaccine syndrome had significantly higher circulating spike protein levels compared to the control groups, and this was significant. So there's no, no, no question here. Participants with post-vaccine syndrome had significantly higher levels of spike protein. Now, this is not the only mechanism that's stimulating this post-vaccine syndrome, but it certainly does seem to be one of them. Ongoing production of spike protein. And we've looked at various reasons why that might be. Uh, and so post-vaccine syndrome, even without evidence of infection, higher levels of spike protein than controls. And detectable S1 spike protein was found in participants' plasma ranging from 26 to 709 days from the most recent known vaccination. So persistence there basically for two years. If we come back in another year's time, will we still find it? Could, could well. But at the moment, the count is up to over 709 days. Not... Uh, not, not good at all. One of the authors said uh, that was surprising to find the spike protein in circulation at such a late point in time. Well, to, to be quite honest, to me it wasn't uh, because um, we, we've, we've seen from treatments against the spike protein that that can massively reduce the clinical features. So I wasn't too surprised at that actually. Some uh, post-vaccine syndrome patients did have, didn't have much spike protein. So there's other mechanisms going on here like autoimmunity, tissue damage, Epstein-Barr virus re reactivation, which as we said is infective mononucleosis. And with more research, we'll probably find there's many mechanisms of action actually. Many probably will be related to, the, related to spike protein, but then we'll have others that aren't. Spike protein ones could be affecting the nervous system, for example. Other things could be affecting the, the muscles. That is possible. More knowledge uh, needed on that. So that comes from the Yale Listen study. Listen stands for Listen to Immune Symptom and Treatment Experiences Now. OK, it's a bit of a stretch, but there you go. That's fine. And they had uh, 42 patients who had the post-vaccine syndrome and 22 patients who didn't report anything. And one of the researchers said this. Um, it's clear that some individuals are experiencing significant challenges after vaccination. Our responsibility of scientists and clinicians is to listen to their experiences, rigorous, rigorously investigate the underlying cause and seek ways to help, which of course we would completely agree with. So temporal correlations are there, plausible mechanisms of action are there, post-vaccine syndrome needs to be recognised by the wider medical community. Let me know what you think, but for now, thank you for watching.